गुरुर् ब्रह्मा गुरुर् विष्णु गुरुर् देवो महेश्वरा गुरुर् साक्षात परब्रह्म तस्मै श्री गुरुवे नमः सो विद सल्यूटेशंस टू द टीचर विल प्रोसीड um this is a nice setting for a intimate satsang so i'm going to talk for a little while and then let's have a dialogue i mean not dialogue i'm worried about saying dialogue because in uh, in the bhagavad gita which is considered a samvad in the end you see that krishna is doing all the talking so Uh, and Arjuna is mostly listening. He butts in now and then, but mostly. So I don't want it to be turned that way. That was because it is Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. This is only M Uvacha. So we can look at it in a different way. <coughs> um, so first, let me start with this. There is this. Hello. You. <laughs> there is this popular um, word, which nowadays. uh goes around the world people are beginning to discover it's good and so on even in hollywood it's become very popular so anybody guess the word yoga <laughs> yoga <laughs> so um it's become such a popular word so i thought today in the setting we are sitting near the river with these big trees uh like the yogis sat in the ancient times in the forest hermitages except that there were no planes disturbing them perhaps there was a vimana or two we don't know so <clears throat> we would discuss this word yoga what what it means is there only one kind of yoga or what is the meaning of the word yoga is there only the hollywood variety or are there different kinds of yoga and so because the ancients who had done deep study of the word yoga understood that there could be different kinds of yoga so they generally divided the word yoga the the practice of yoga or the theory of yoga into a few rough uh heads one the yoga of physical well being people say this is hatha yoga so it's not so good and so on but hold on it's not just that hatha yoga is not just standing on your head for an hour and shaking your legs in the air that's not complete hatha yoga um and if you want to go deeper into the subject the best text available today with us which fortunately is now available in translation is the hatha pradipika of so atma rama <coughs> who is from the nath sampradaya well i also belong to nath sampradaya but i don't have the paraphernalia uh so this is a very good text if you want to go deep into hatha yoga now let me tell you that hatha yoga does not mean only physical yoga there's a misunderstanding there um hatha yoga the word ha stands for um plus plus like if you have an anode and a cathode i'm ju- i'm deliberately not using the word positive negative because when you say negative then it has a very negative effect when you say positive then it looks like the opposite so what i'm trying to say is that uh it's like an anode for electricity you need an anode and a cathode anode is always plus and the cathode is minus so in the same way when you say hatha it comes from two words ha is a symbol of the sun heat light tapas this is ha and tha is the uh symbol used to represent the moon which is cool and which is cold i mean not cold but cool opposite the heat of the sun and at the same time when you say cool it's not freezing but it kind of gives you a cool atmosphere if anybody went out yesterday evening with the full moon on you would have 
known what I am talking about. So, when you say Hatha, I am going to other things, do not don't think I am only going to talk about Hatha Yoga. Uh, it means the way or the means by which you can balance the Ha and the Tha. The yogic theory is that in the human body, there is many pranas of which the chief pranas are called prana and apana. And the prana and the apana, Krishna says, Krishna or Vedavyasa, whoever, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the chapter called Dhyana Yoga, he says the yogi is one who fixes his attention on the Brumadhyaya, sits in a comfortable posture, asana, and balances his prana and apana. Which means what? That in most of us, the prana and the apana are unbalanced. Or is it unbalanced or imbalanced? Which is bottom? Unbalanced. Not in balance. Not in proper symmetry. Or symmetry with S. <laughs> not the other symmetry. So, um, the other meaning is that Ha also is the yogic anatomy and physiology. It's not. It's similar to the medical uh, anatomy and physiology, but you might find a little bit of uh, um, controversy on that. So I'm just saying anatomy and physiology of yoga. They have a description of the ida and the pingala, the two nadis. Nadi meaning channels. Every human being is supposed to have innumerable channels, nadis. Of them, the main being uh, Ida, Pingala and Shushumna. So, the central channel is the Shushumna and the left one is the Ida and the right is the Pingala. So, the Pingala Nadi is the heat Nadi, the fire Nadi associated with the sun. And the left which is the Ida Nadi is associated with uh, the cool energy of the moon. So, Hatha here means the practice by which these are balanced. And then the prana is made to, if you balance these two energies, the prana can enter the central channel called the Shushumna. Now, various people have identified the Ida and Pingala and the Shushumna with the parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve and so on. We will not get too much technical into that. Uh, but the wellness factor, which is when you feel, oh, I am perfect, I am feeling quite well and pleasant today, happens when your parasympathetic system is in good shape. So, the yoga, Hatha Yoga is the practice of how to bring it about through physical activity or physical exercises and then from there you graduate. You do not get stuck there, but you graduate, which does not mean that you should do all the 108 asanas prescribed and so on. In fact, in the earlier texts on yoga, there were only about 12 or 18 asanas described and then people expanded on it. They added some other exercises like uh, gymnastics and, and so on and now it is very big. So, this is basically what Hatha Yuga is. Hmm? And it lays great stress on the physical body because if you do not have a healthy body, it is very difficult to have a healthy mind. So, there are restrictions in diet, I mean moderation in diet and so on and so forth. What you eat, you know, yoga is derived also the philosophy of yoga, darsana. You know that in ancient uh, Indian philosophy, there are six darsanas. Very interesting. They are not philosophies, but the word used is darsana. Now, darsana means what? What is darshan? To see, to be face to face with. So, all the philosophies in ancient India were not philosophies, where philosophers just sat with their pipes and thought. It is about actual having the understanding of the essence of this, which is darshan. So, among the darshanas, the, uh, there is of course the Purva Maimamsa, there is the Nyaya, there is the uh, Vaisheshika, there is the Sankhya, there is the Vedanta and then there is Yoga. Yoga seems to be the last. 
So, therefore, there is an advantage that yoga has drawn from all these sources, because it has come in the end. In fact, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which are kind of the textbooks on the practice of yoga, in the most concise form available to us, you may say it is Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga. So, we will come to that. <coughs> Actually, post dates the Yogacara textbooks of the Buddhists. The Buddhists and the Jains also have a lot of yogic practice. So, after the mention of yoga in Kathopanishad, Mahabharata, uh, Sveta Ashvatara and so, and so on, the next uh, place where yoga is dealt with elaborately are the Yogacara textbooks of the Buddhists and the Jains. Now, you know that the Jains have an atheistic philosophy. They do not believe in an Ishwara God. They want to purify their souls and attain Nirvana. And therefore, yoga is an important part of their practice. If you look at all the Tirthankaras of Jains and of course, Buddha, they all sit in yogic postures. They may not have Ishwara concept. Buddha also did not have. Of course, now everybody worships Buddha. That's Human beings want to worship something. Not easy. But they have an intensive and uh, complex system of yogic practices. After that comes the standard textbook called the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. So, um, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are termed Raja Yoga Sutras. So, what does that mean? So, from Hatha Yoga, where have we gone? to Raja Yoga. Now, when you say Raja Yoga, it simply means, the word means King Yoga. Not that it is meant for kings, but that it is considered to be, while Hatha Yoga basically is a starting point like a ladder which deals more with the body and gets it fit to go to the next section which is the mind, Raja Yoga deals with the mind. So, you can say it is the mind yoga, uh, not opposed to, but complementing the body yoga. Now, if you say I can do Raja yoga without doing Hatha yoga, well, it is possible for some rare individuals who are blessed with perfect health and so on. But it is a good idea to do a little bit of this and then proceed, because it has always been like a ladder moving towards this. So, in fact, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali which Patanjali himself defines as Kriya Yoga. Do not think that Kriya Yoga is only taught by other people. Patanjali's Yoga Sutras begins with saying that this is Kriya Yoga. That means what? A practical way of moving forward. Kriya. Kriya is not a brand. <laughs> Kriya means something that you have by which you can systematically practice and move forward. This is what it means, Kriya. Uh, and the Gita defines yoga as yogam karma su kausalya. That means yoga is how to work with complete tranquility and auspiciousness. So, even if you look at the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which many people accept as the standard textbook, it starts actually by saying, defining yoga, not as an asana or a pranayam, but as yoga, first it says yoga anushasanam, here begins the teaching on yoga and then he says yoga is chitta vritti nirodha. So, it is a sutra, you know, in a sutra, so many things are put together and tightly knitted on. It needs a commentary to understand the sutra. And the two prominent commentaries which have been existing since long time are one is of Vyasa. We do not know which Vyasa because Vyasa simply means a compiler. So, it, it need not be necessarily Veda Vyasa, but some Vyasa has commented on the Yoga Sutras. So, the Vyasa's commentary on the Yoga Sutras is one of the most important. I am saying all this because when you when you have time, instead of wasting it on, uh, what is that, 
what are the popular uh, writers, I don't know. You can read this because now they are available in English language which is also fortunately for us Indians a link language. So, uh, the other commentary which is beautiful is by someone called Vachaspati Mishra, the other commentary on the Yoga Sutra. So, these two are the standard texts. You do not have to go into it. I am just saying when you have some time you can just lie down and read it instead of reading about the shootings in Jacksonville and so on. So, <coughs> um, well that has to be tackled in some way but not in our hands. Uh, so, just look at the beginning of the Yoga Sutras. After saying Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha, then he goes on to describe what is called the Samadhi, for how to attain that state of mind where the mind becomes tranquil. Now, Chitta Vritti Nirodha means, uh, there is various translations for it, but I would uh, translate it according to Maheshwarnath Babaji. I studied the Yoga Sutras with him, my guru. I would say, Yogas means Yoga, Chitta Vritti Nirodha means. Yoga is the stilling of the distractions of the mind. Let us put it this way. Or yoga is the uh, overcoming of the contradictions and distractions of the mind stuff. The mind is always moving up and down. Sometimes here, sometimes there, uh, sometimes happy, sometimes sad. There is all, it is like a, uh, what is that thing children go on? Huh? It is a roller coaster ride. So, yoga is how to balance this roller coaster movement of the mind and make it quiet. Because for anything spiritual to happen, for anything to go beyond our ordinary understanding, you need to have a tranquil mind. It is the take off point. It is not everything, but it is, it's, I would say it is the, it's the tarmac from which you can take off, perfectly made the runway. This is an essential thing, whatever be the yoga you practice. So, therefore, yoga is chit. And having said all that, then he divides yoga into eight limbs. But nowhere does Patanjali himself call it Ashtanga Yoga. It is a popular saying because it has eight angas, but he always refers to it as Kriya Yoga. You will not find the word Ashtanga Yoga anywhere in the Yoga Sutras. But now it's been popularized. By, uh, long ago, I went to Wisconsin. There was a group practicing uh, Ashtanga Yoga, mostly whites from Wisconsin, and uh, young people very enthusiastic. So before we had a talk on yoga, I asked them, "Who do you do you know the founder of Ashtanga Yoga?" They said, "Yes." I said, "Who?" I said, "B.K. Sayangar." <laughs> I said, "Look." P.K. Zayangar, with all due respects, was a great popularizer of Ashtanga Yoga. Patanjali must be turning in his grave. So, anyway, Patanjali never called it Ashtanga Yoga, but it has eight angas or eight branches or eight parts. And these eight parts are start with Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi. So, when all these things come together, you have shifted already from Hatha Yoga to the Raja Yogas. Uh, because the first thing said is not Asana, but Yama Niyama. What are the rules and regulations to be followed by one who wants to step by step move into stilling of his mind? And after the mind is still, then you have other ways to move. But this is essential anyway. So, how to go about this? So, it starts with Yama Niyama are the principles of life which one needs to adopt in order to be able to sit down and tranquilize you. I mean, not tranquilize, make your mind tranquil. <laughs> Tranquilizing will be terrible. But tranquil, that you can pop a tablet. <laughs> so, 
in fact the yogic mind is tranquil quiet but very alert it's not as if it's gone to sleep or drugged it's very alert intelligence works one pointedly and it's very alert and it sees everything it's not that its eyes are shut you see everything but you see everything together normally what happens when we are engaged in day to day life i have to say this i come back to one of our sense organs are working super time to the exclusion of others but in a yogi who has attained what is called chitta vritti nirola the mind is quiet and tranquil all the senses work equally not just one so there is no uh, uh, too much doing in any one side you see what i mean now i'm sitting here i'm talking to you you're listening i can hear the cicadas i can hear the sounds of the traffic far away i can see the expressions on your faces i can see the trees going straight up into the sky the flight the water in the river but the mind is not disturbed it's quiet i'm telling you this is how i feel i can't prove it to you but it's so uh there was a great uh, king janaka of videha very famous because sita is supposed to be his daughter and he was a disciple of the great yogi yajnavalkya and later on ashtavakra but yajnavalkya and uh, once he used to attend the satsangs like this in the forest the yajnavalkya sitting and the rest of the people so there was always a asana reserved for janaka in the front so you know as usual some people used to whisper and i think because he is the king he is given so much importance even the rishi is giving so much rishis don't answer questions like that so he kept quiet if you're not a rishi you would have said shut up i'll do what i want but he was a rishi so he <laughs> was at peace with himself and peace with the world so he just let it go so one day there was a big fire that broke out in videha and it was coming towards the forest and these other rishis who were the students of the rishi was it who had just a kamandalu and a kaupin generally no other positions and maybe a hut started running helter skelter saying my kamandalu is going my and janaka whose whole country was involved was sitting in his asana and saying so sir what were you saying just now can we continue yajnavalkya had to tell him go back because your city is on fire so yajnavalkya said this is the difference between you and janaka <laughs> see so it's not that you don't function in the world but you know how to settle your mind one pointedly various things and do what is right at the right time anyway so yama niyamas are rules and regulations to be followed in life please don't think that the yoga is an other worldly philosophy it's meant for us now hmm idam at this moment here so the basic rules of yama niyamas is moderation krishna describes it beautifully in the gita by saying this yoga is not for him who eats too much which is why i refuse the samosa before coming here <laughs> who eats too much or eats too little um sleeps too much or sleeps too little i mean this is just a metaphor meaning that there has to be moderation in everything uh but it also begins with one of the first yamas which is ahimsa now ahimsa not as a moral concept but as an actual practice one thing to have ahimsa as a moral concept or a philosophical concept other thing to actually practice it ahimsa here means not to have not to think evil of others or not to cause injury to other living beings 
to the best extent possible. If you could do that fully, then you are already a yogi. There is nothing, no yama niyamas need be applied. But to begin with, one should consider. Now, this I must say, that it's not just physical injury. Sometimes physical injury may be not so bad as mental injury. Uh, there are some people, I know somebody who is, who is uh, 65 years old and still carries in his mind the fact that somebody hurt him mentally when he was 9 years old. If it was a slap, it would have vanished in 10 minutes. But this is, cannot go. It's very difficult to go. So therefore, you want to react and take revenge. What Patanjali says is avoid this. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's over and done with. Move forward. So, ahimsa means the tendency, the, the state of mind where you don't honestly positively, not positively, honestly um, and actively want to cause injury to others, mental as well as physical. Not difficult, not easy to practice, but possible. The other is satya, which means try to be truthful, try to, very difficult in modern times, I can get that. Because we live in a life of lies and make-belief. What about the TV ads that come? This is the best product on earth. Very soon they will say in all the seven heavens. So, when you are constantly exposed, you automatically buy the product. We are living in a world of lies. We live in a world of YouTubes. And I'm also on YouTube. I don't know when the iTube will come. It's all YouTube. So, can we, what they mean by satya is can we live honestly and be truthful in our dealings. It's not easy. But you can try your best. The other thing is, it's actually quite a contradiction in terms. And I am seeking for the absolute truth and 24-7 I tell lies. How is this possible? Isn't that a contradiction? 24-7, I, I love lying. There are some people who love lying. They can't, uh, it's a compulsion. They can't help it. But what are you looking for? The truth. The absolute truth. Is this possible? So, somewhere along the line, put a break. Unless you are a lawyer, you can live, I'm sorry. I hope there are no lawyers. You can live without telling. <laughs> so, or a politician. You can still live. So, um, Satya, hmm, Ahimsa, then Astya, which means to try not to de uh, desire for other people's property, to grab it. Because when you buy property, it is first somebody else and then you are buying it. But the attitude of saying that I want everything that others have is a dangerous option. And then Brahmacharya. Now, this is the most misunderstood word, Brahmacharya. Some people think that Brahmacharya means forced celibacy, full. But we must understand that the great rishis who have given us the Upanishads, the Yoga Shastras, the Veda, I think 99% of them were all people with families, married, living in the hermitage. Even the greatest one, Yajna Valki, had two wives. I'm not advocating two wives <laughs> now, but one is better. <laughs> and before he leaves to the forest for his tapasya, he says to Maitri, the, one of his wives who is interested in these matters, I'm going to the forest for Vanaprastha. What do you think? She says, if you're going, I'm also coming because I'm also interested. And in Brihadharanyaka, you can see him teaching his wife why he is going and what is the matter. And that is the subject of what is called Jnana Yoga. We will come to that. So, Yama Niyamas. The golden rule is moderation. Moderate yourself. In this world, you have to have things, but 
We want to don't every month don't change your TV. Every six months don't change your. I'm not saying don't, but I'm trying to explain what it means. Uh, and the next after yama niyama etc comes asana. So asana is also a part of Patanjali. So like the yoga pradipika says, the hatha yoga pradipika says, hatha pradipika says. The asanas and the pranayamas are a stepping stone, a ladder to the higher ones. So, there is the asanas. Uh, now, asanas according to Patanjali is defined in one sentence, tirasukham asana. That posture which gives you comfort for a length of time is your asana. However, there are, it is understood that there are a few simple asanas which can be practiced from a trained practitioner, from one who can teach you how to practice. And then again, moderation, do not go to extremes. Yoga can make you grow as well as kill you, watch out. So, moderation is essential. Then after asanas, now also asanas are not just physical exercises, um, they are not muscle building exercises. Of course, they keep your muscles fit and but supple and they keep your spine steady. The yogi who practices asanas from the beginning does not need a back support. I think 90 percent of our back diseases, spinal uh, bones problems come because we lean all the time. Yeah, there is nothing to lean. So, you lean all the time. If you sit straight, everything is balanced. So, um, okay, so what did I say? Huh? Asana. Asana. Now, from asana, oh yeah, so asana also has a very special purpose, which is very scientific and uh, quite practical, and which is that they also are meant to bring your ductless glands, your endocrine system into proper function, not just physical. Physical of course, it is based on the principle that if you want to relax your body, you need to tense it first. Like when you are working hard in the garden and then when you go to sleep, you are totally relaxed. If your muscles are not active, then how will you relax? You won't even know what relaxation is, it is a contrast. So, yoga asana is based on the principle that when you do a posture, you are actually tightening the muscles and then when you come back out of the posture, it becomes relaxed. When you tighten and relax the muscles, then the energy flows into it, the prana flows into it. This is the principle and also to keep your spine supple. You will see that in most asanas either you go this way or you go this way, right. And then sometimes head down asanas because most of the time the blood really does not circulate well in our heads. So, if you cannot do asanas at least go and if you do not want to bow down before a human being, go under a tree and bow down under the tree many times. It is good for your brain because the blood circulates here. If you think somebody will see you, do it in a secret place, it does not matter. <laughs> somebody said, I did not, I went to the temple but I did not bow down. I said, why? Because my boss was standing around. Shame the last obstacle to understanding. Anyway, that is a different matter. So, um, so let us see this. We have this endocrine system starting with the pituitary gland which controls the entire system, it is the master gland. When you feel good, and when you are, then one of the endocrine glands pumps a little bit of initiates or triggers a little bit of serotonin or dopamine into your system. So, you are nice, you feel good. Where does it happen? In the master gland. It is also the growth gland. It controls many other functions. And then under the pituitary gland almost is there is a little gland called the pineal gland, which also does. So, this is why head down postures or bowing down, touching your head to the ground is very important because it increases the circulation in these areas. 
the pineal gland uh, some 60, 70 years ago, it was considered a waste organ, vestige organ. They said there is no function, it is just sitting there. In spite of the fact that it has the same kind of cones that you have in the optic system. But people thought, why it is a waste, like you are vermiform appendix, it is a, okay. 50 years ago they discovered there is a very important function very important for all of us. We need to sleep, right? When it gets dark, when there is no direct light shining on us, the pineal gland releases melatonin into your bloodstream. Then you are in Shushupti. So first you go into Sopna Vasta, then Shushupti, same thing. So, deep sleep, melatonin. Fifty years ago they thought it is a waste of when you have a jet lag, what is happening? It is called the circadian rhythm, sleeping and waking up. It is disturbed because of the time problem. What do you do? Pop a melatonin tablet. Not a good idea. If you give three days, it will be okay. <laughs> but then we are so busy, we cannot sit in the office and sleep. But the yogi can, after traveling, ten times in a day, come back in three different zones, sit for ten minutes and adjust his because he knows where it is and how to work on it. Which means, through the practice you can control organs which are normally not controlled by us, but by the parasympathetic system. Autonomous. For a yogi there is no autonomous. It is under control. I am just saying because you should not get the idea that yoga is just some nonsense. I mean, lot of work, lot of things. People who are in the medical field, who are neurologists, who are uh, endocrinologists should go deeply into this and study it at least. It is an open thing to understand. There is no mystery. There is no dark room initiations. So, um, now what did I say? Hmm? I am just trying to figure out if you are hearing me. Or not. <laughs> mm. So, Okay. Then there are the other glands. There is the adrenal gland, there is the uh, thyroid, there are the many glands. And they can all be made balanced in their functioning by the practice of certain asanas. I will give you a concrete example. Suppose you are the kind who flies at a slight insult. You are an angry man or an angry woman. I mean. Uh, I must, <laughs> it could be both sides, sorry, I can't be partial. Um, there is this beautiful story. It also shows how a human being's ego can be controlled better if he gets married. <laughs> I'm not saying because I'm married. <laughs> um, this is about a madman who is was considered a joker, Mullah Nasruddin. You must have heard his stories, they are very funny stories. They are supposed to be jokes, but they are very serious things. They are like the Zen Kwans. You can read a lot into the story. So, this is Mullah Nasruddin uh, was one day walking on the footpath when he saw, in wherever he was, somewhere in the Middle East. When he saw somebody on the footpath with a towel spread out, selling a very old uh, things like swords, and, you know, swords, uh, shields, spears, bow and arrows, rusted ones. And he was quoting a very, very high price for them. So, Mullah went and asked him, why are you quoting such a high price for what appears to be rusty swords and things like that? What is the matter? This guy said, yeah, you don't know. Um, you see, this is a rusty sword. Well, long ago when Sultan Saladin swung it, ten heads would be cut off at one swing. That's the important. You don't know about antiques. So he said, okay, fine, thank you. Next day, Nasruddin also put on the other side of the footpath a towel and brought old pots and pans from the kitchen and kept it there. Spoons, pots, ladles, 
and also a pair of uh, tongs, you know, tongs to lift up hot vessels, chumta. Then he picked up the chumta and he said, more expensive than the sword of Saladin. So this guy came this side and said, hey, what's this? Only old pots and pans. Why are you charging so much for this pair of tongs? They are ordinary pair of tongs from some kitchen. He said, yeah, they may appear to you as ordinary, just like he said. But when my wife throws it, it clears nine feet and hits me exactly on the right temple. <laughs> That's the special. <laughs> you can read things into the stories. I am just leaving it there. So, why did I come to this story? Hmm? Yeah, anger. So, suppose you want to control your anger. Suppose. There are many people who don't want to. They are very happy with it. But suppose you, are, you want to control your anger. There are people who love to be angry, but we can't do anything about that. We leave them alone. Suppose somebody feels this anger is a terrible thing. It's causing unness and has realized that it doesn't really do anything. It, uh, in fact, if you had been calm, you could have done things better than getting angry and shouting it. And in anger, one loses one's balance. You know, the, the angry uh, watchman might slap the boss in anger. He doesn't know where he is, what's happening. The brain is in a kind of a muddle. So, there is this, uh, uh, in Karnataka, there is a section of people called the Lingayats. And it were, the Lingayat uh, movement was founded by the great Basaveshwara, Basavanna. Basaveshwara has written beautiful uh, uh, vachanas, very lovely vachanas. And um, in one of the vachanas, he says, hey, foolish fellow, if you get angry, your house is on fire, nothing happens to the neighbor's house, <laughs> you know. You destroy yourself. So, but even though we realize this, sometimes it's not possible to get. What I'm trying to say is that while you think yoga is just a physical, it's not. Because it has something to do with the endocrine glands. And what is the gland that works in excess when you're angry? Adrenaline. Adrenaline. When you're angry, what happens? You check your blood, there's a big dose of adrenaline pumped into the system. You are angry, you are shaking, heartbeat goes up, adrenaline. Now, there is an asana actually, but first you have to theoretically understand that you need to get rid of it. Otherwise, there is no point. Suppose you have understood, yes, it is not good for me. This is part of yama niyama, so I have to do it. So then, there is an asana, which if you practice regularly, having understood that anger is not good for you, important. It can certainly get rid of it, but you need to practice for a time. It's like Ayurveda, you need to practice for a long time. It's not like buying tablets and popping into your mouth. It, there's various other factors involved, like dinachara and so on. So, in the same way, you need to practice it at least for three to four months before it has its effect. In this field, there are no quick fixes. There is no shortcut. So, and this asana, which massages the adrenal glands and keeps it tranquil, is the matsyasana. If you really do the practice of matsyasana for a long time, you will see that slowly you are bringing your anger under control. Intention has to be there. I said that in the beginning. If you think you are happy with anger, that is fine. Carry on. <laughs> until somebody kills you or you kill somebody. So, um, have you seen Matsyasana? Somebody knows Matsyasana? Somebody who is not wearing a sari, of course, because it is difficult to do Matsyasana. Anybody? You can? You are not wearing a sari? Okay. Come, let's see. You need a rug? This is what I 
think it was. I don't know okay. exactly the correct way. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I'll lie down this one though. Lying down is Shavasana. No, no. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> This is half. Padmasana. Yes, this is Artha. If you sit in Padmasana and do the same thing, then you have Matsyasana. I can try. Oh, wow. yeah, lift your head up and pull your finger, uh, toes with your hand. But keep your... <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I can do Artha Padmasana. Yes, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Now, this is Matsyasana. You see what happens here? These muscles, where the adrenal glands are somewhere here, where are they? Shivani, where are they? Huh? Near the kidneys, here. Yeah, you see this. They are, the muscles there massage this area. And by constant massage, it controls the amount of adrenaline pumped into the system. So, what I am trying to say is not just physical, it is much more than that. But, we have to go beyond. You can sit. So, that's okay. So, with, uh, so asana, then comes pranayam. Now, we are talking about Hatha Yoga ascending into Raja Yoga, Yoga Sutras. Then you have the pranayam, asana, pranayama. Now, pranayam is how to control your breath, which is linked to your prana. Oh, pranayam is not controlling the breath, because it is controlling the prana, but it, prana is intimately linked to the shwasa. Therefore, if you control your breath, you can control your prana. So, various exercises, I cannot go into that. However, one exercise of simple pranayam, which may contribute to the next steps that come, is called uh, is you know if you look at yourself when you are agitated, angry, and so on, and quietly watch your breath. What happens? You will find that your breathing has also become very excited when you are angry or when you irritated or when you are doing hard work, physical, your breathing is very hard, right? Or ten times you climb the staircase up and down, your breath is very hard, harsh, the rhythm. On the other hand, when you are sitting quietly in the evening and listening to music or listening to the songs of the cicadas or listening to beautiful sound of flute coming from somewhere, thinking that maybe this is Vrindavan and somebody is blowing this lovely flute, your mind is completely relaxed and your breath is also relaxed. Just watch. So, the yogi said, if the condition of your mind is affecting your breath, is it possible to change your rhythms so that your mind can be affected? So, from this many pranayams came about and one of the simplest one, no point in talking only theories, to be practical, it is very simple. If you even watch your breath or become aware of your breath, the breath slows down. Deliberately. We never give attention to breath, it is such an important thing. When it stops, we are dead. From the time we are in the womb, it keeps moving. So, if you just close your eyes and give a little attention to your breath, you don't even have to control it. As you give attention, you will see that it slows down and after a while you feel like giving a deep sigh and then you are settled. So, pranayam is the science of calming down your prana using your breath. There are many kinds of pranayams. We don't go into details because we have to go up, further up. Then from pranayam, the next step is called pratyahara, according to the ashtangas. Pratyahara has been variously translated as sense withdrawal and so on and so forth. 
But let me explain this. Pratyahara, pratyahara means the capacity which the yogi has to develop through practice of trying to fix his attention one pointedly on something whenever he wants and disconnect whenever he wants. It's not just fixing. If you are fixing your attention in, on something and you cannot disconnect from it, then you are obsessed. A yogi is not an obsessed guy. He fixes his attention and he withdraws it when he wants. It comes only through practice, one point of attention and withdrawing and fixing it on something else. So when a yogi is one who when he drives is not meditating, you know what will happen if you meditate? Not only to yourself but also to the poor people on the road. A yogi when he is driving, is driving completely. When he is meditating, he has nothing to do with his car, he is meditating. This capacity of switching on and switching off is pratyahara. So therefore you see, yoga is a practical way of living in this world and yet moving forward through the mind. So, Pratyahara. So this one-pointedness comes through practice, withdrawing, fixing. It comes only through, as Patanjali himself says, Nairantariya Bhyasena, through regular and incessant practice, there are no shortcuts. That's why when somebody says, I have a shortcut to moksha, I'm very worried. I wonder how many people are going to fall into this business now. Especially when you charge for it. So anyway, so, <coughs> so what happened? Yeah, we are at Pratyahara. I wanted to tell you something more, but it's already... Seven, going to be 7.30. So, let's proceed. So, after Pratyahara comes, come three words which together in English we call meditation. Dharana, Dhyana and Samadhi. All these put together in English we generally use the word meditation or trance. Now, Dharana is again the capacity developed by the yogi to fix his attention one-pointedly on either an object or an idea or a deity or a sound or a symbol excluding everything else, exclusively on that. This again has to be developed through pranayam, through proper food through yama niyamas. Can you imagine somebody who doesn't follow yama niyamas trying to fix his attention on something? You can't. It's always disturbed. When you hate somebody and when you sit down you think of the person you hate, you cannot mend it. Or you are so hungry, you haven't eaten enough, how will you meditate? Or you have eaten so much, do you know how to meditate after eating? Very soon you can hear the sound of Om in a different way. <laughs> so, having balanced all that, when you are able to fix your attention on something, then that is called dharana, exclusively. It's also used in diet, worshipping the deity, complete attention out there, no other. And then, the next is dhyana. Dhyana is an automatic continuation of dharana when there are no more disturbances. It's like pouring oil, it's dhara, dharana. It's like a dhara, a flow that is continuous. So, from dhyana, from dharana comes dhyana. The root for dhyana is dhi. Dhi in Sanskrit, dhyo, yo, na. Uh, Bhargo Devas Yadhi Mahi means I meditate upon. Dhi is the root, Dhyana. So, then from Dhyana, when the person is so absorbed in that, whatever he is looking at, one point of attention, so much so that he has forgotten himself, there is only that. 
then there is no meditator and there is nothing to meditate. It's all one. This is Samadhi. Sama means completely settled, equal, Dhi, Dhyana. No disturbance whatsoever. Is there a criteria for Samadhi? Because you can have altered state of consciousness with LST or with Ganja or with Bhang. What is the criteria? When you actually go into yogic samadhi, which appears sometimes the same out, outwardly, when you come out you are wiser than you were before. This is the criteria. You cannot come back as the same person, you have changed. This is the now Hatha Yoga, Raj Yoga. Now they have the ancients have also given different names for other forms of yoga. But then basically the mind has to settle down. There is no question about that. And these are what we call Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga and so on. So karma Yoga, why the word Karma Yoga? It would be wonderful if you have a synthesis and the judicious mixing of all these yogas. That is the ideal thing to do. However, each person is made differently. Each person's mental background and so on is different from the other. So, some may concentrate more on one kind of yoga and some may go to the other kind of yoga. You can't say they are wrong or right. However, if you can balance all of them, it is great. But if you can't, that doesn't mean you are not a yogi. You're not, you can't say he's not a yogi because he's not doing asanas, he's not breathing through one. There may be other yogis, other kind of yogis. So, the thing with yoga, Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga is that it is systematic and you can go step by step and see the difference and move on. That's the difference. But there are people who are overwhelmed with emotion. As long as they're not overwhelmed with negative emotion or positive emotion then Bhakti Marga is good for them. Because they are making those emotions creative in their own way, not destructive. So there are people who don't need any practice, they are just there. Uh, it, it, bhakti is spontaneous, only some people have it. You can't cultivate it. If you cultivate it is an artificial development of something, which is close to Bhakti, but <laughs> Bhakti is it's something that comes spontaneously in certain situations. It's possible that it may come also into manifestation when you are close to somebody who knows about it or who has experienced it. Because it's very uh, infectious. Now there, there is a positive and negative side to it also. It can be infectious to the extent of taking you on to some kind of a hysteria. It's a positively infectious when it gives you a tranquility of mind and something beautiful or the darshan of the deity or whatever. So there are two ways. So if you are practicing yama niyamas, the chance of it turning into just hysteria is not there. It's nil, almost nil. So it's a good idea. That doesn't mean you have no emotions, you are filled with emotion. The heart is red, the chest is red, but you know, you're, it's not out of control. Okay. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa once went to meet uh, Dayananda Saraswati. Interesting. Now, Dayananda Saraswati is the Arya Samajist who decided to get rid of all idols everywhere. <laughs> And Ramakrishna Paramahamsa was one who was worshipping Kali. But he was an, a, such an evolved being that for him, he didn't mind taking a towel and putting it on his shoulder and going and meeting anybody. He didn't sit there and say, everybody come to me. So he went with a towel actually on his head so that nobody will find out who he is and met then the Saraswati and he came back and said, yeah, he's talking about pure Vedanta and breaking of idols and all that, 
but man has a lot of devotion. So somebody, how do you know? Well, when you were speaking of the Brahman, his chest became red. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's okay. So, I have some control over anger, don't worry. <laughs> so, um, some. <laughs> so, when the, <laughs> so when the mind, uh, so, in, this is bhakti devotion and it is spontaneous. Um, some people used to come and ask uh, my Guru Maheshwarnath Babaji, can you uh, teach us Kriya Yoga? So he used to tell him that you are not fit for Kriya Yoga. But don't think that Kriya Yoga is the only way to find the truth. My parampara is Kriya Yoga, I am saying this openly to you. He used to ask this question, what Kriya Yoga did Mirabai practice, can you tell me? That's Bhakti, that's, a diff that's also a Yoga. <laughs> or he used to say, what Kriya Yoga on the other side did Ramana Maharshi practice? Nothing. So do you think Kriya is the only way out? If you still feel, come back after thinking about it. So anyway. So, bhakti is meant for people whose hearts are more important. When I say heart, not the organ that pumps blood, I'm talking about feelings. And then you have jnana yoga, which is considered to be the ultimate in one sense of the term. Like the contemporary example we know of is Ramana Maharshi, who went to the source of his being by questioning who he was. But you can't do that simply by sitting down and saying, who am I, who am I? That's like a chant, it doesn't work. You can as well say Coca-Cola. Yeah. It, it, it is not that, it's re seriously trying to figure out who I am. What is my... But for him it happened again spontaneously. Because when he was a young man, he suddenly experienced that he was not the body. That set him thinking that if I am not the body, then who am I? Now I know that I am the body and I simply by saying who am I, it doesn't work that way. I have to read what he says. Fortunately, this man hardly spoke. He was silent. All he spoke was a small book called Who Am I? And it's in originally in Tamil, Nan Yar. So, instead of sitting and saying who am I, read it. There's a lot of hints in that, what he means by who am I. And Jnana Yoga, fortunately for us, is not as people think, an intellectual way to find the truth. In fact, the Upanishadic teachings and all the commentaries on it written by uh, many Acharyas, including Adi Shankara, uh, mainly to say that the most intelligent person very soon realizes the limitations of his or her intellect. And the Upanishad says, na tatra jakshur gachyati, na vag gachyati, no mana, that the mind, the eye does not go, the ear does not go and so on, and then finally says, no mana, which means even the mind doesn't go. Which means to say that with your puny little limited framework of what we call rationalism, you cannot find that which is infinite. It requires something else. Yeah, we can go up to that theoretically and stand there. But if you want to cross the threshold, you cross it when you rem and realize with complete humility that this puny little brain cannot access that which is infinite. If it could, then it won't be infinite anymore. We are conglomeration of finites. To understand, when this, under, this is understood, there comes a humility, which is very close to devotion, to bhakti. And it is proved in many cases. Ramana Maharshi attained his inner self through inquiry. So he said, so people say, but when textbooks like Sri Prabandham, etc. 
were sung before him, he used to shed tears of joy. Why? Because it is the same thing which he had touched. But he understood by understanding that the intellect cannot reach there. So it's not an intellectual way of finding. It's meant for people who like to think that I am very intelligent. Good. And therefore I am going on the intellectual path. But then what one should understand is what the Upanishad is trying to prove, which of course is the fountainhead of Vedanta. That there are things other than the ordinary mind, which are not active in most people. Even if you ask somebody who studied the brain and behavior, they will tell you that we use only 20% of our brain for all our activities, including computers. What happens to the rest? Have we explored it? So this exploration is the Jnana Marga, to go into those. And it is somehow connected with yoga, because yoga is an, also an exploration of the latent instruments of perception in our being, other than the five senses, other than the panchendriyas. Panchendriyas we all know. The five senses, the yogis, the rishis said, there are other instruments of perception in your being. If you don't, if those don't open, you have access only to the physical world. So, while yoga is the way of opening it through practice, jnana is the way of opening it by realizing the limitations of the ordinary mind and therefore the humility and devotion that comes out of it. So, roughly these are the yogas we have. Hmm? So I rest my case. <laughs> it's 7.35. We started at 6.30, so it's about one hour. I'm sorry about being late because the problem is, you know, uh, even though we all live in the United States now, we try to follow the ISI, Indian Standard Time, IST. So while we talk, then people come in, in between. So it's a disturbance for others also. So I thought, let's wait. And then the sun was going down. I know there are many people eagerly looking at me because they have questions. <laughs> Some are habitual questioners, but there are others also. So, we can uh, discuss some questions for 15 minutes, uh, if you like. I don't know why Dr. Parikh is not opening his mouth today. So, <laughs> normally, he, he sits in the front row everywhere. It's interesting, I find him everywhere. <laughs> His wife is. <laughs> you go to Switzerland, he's in the front row. You go to somewhere else, Washington, he's sitting there. So, good. But he lives in Atlanta. Huh? I have two questions. Yes, please. Um, Let me tell you one thing before we ask a question. I cannot guarantee that I will have an answer because I haven't heard the question. Yeah. After that, if I can, I'll answer. Okay. You explained about different kinds of uh, yogas. I'll explain uh, the question, don't worry. Huh. So, can you tell me a little bit about Vasi Yoga? Uh, what yoga? Vasi Yoga. What uh, is that? I don't know. Okay. I, I learned something called Vasi Yoga. Vasi. Vasi. V-A-A-S-I. Vasi. What is that? Uh, okay. With... Um, <laughs> Breathing in and out okay. with force oh, 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 okay. and uh, chanting some Bijakshara mantras for each time. I mean, through right one lee mm. goes lam mm. and with left one lee goes yam, uh, yeah, no, bum. M. <laughs> uh. Yeah, that mm. one, um, mm. if you know about it. See, from mm. the description that you give, I think you are talking about a kind of yogic practice which is to do with your breathing and the chanting of Bijakshara, yes. which is a good thing because if you, uh, the fast breathing is Bhastrika. Hmm. Bhastrika in other words is called hyperventilation, uh, which means for a small second to starve the brain of oxygen. 
when you do Bhastrika very fast and in the end when you stop then there is for a split second the starving of oxygen for the brain. When this happens you will feel very still because there is no thought. If the brain is starved of oxygen it can't think. Okay? Nothing, I am not saying anything negative, I am just telling you what it is. So, you feel nice and blank. At that time then, you start breathing alternate nostrils with the Bijaksharas. You said lum? Yeah, lum for uh, and le hum. left, lum and then vam, vam. ram, ram. Um, yam. Only here? Or no. do you do anything here? I mean... No. Now, the, the Bijaksharas which you gave, you, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. which is Lam, Vam, Ram, Yam, mm -hmm. Ham, Om, are the Bijaksharas of the seven chakras, chakras. in mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. in the chakra system or what is called the Yoga Tantras. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you want to go into details of it, there is something called Sat Chakra Nirupana. Mm -hmm. Into which if you go, you will get the I mean, It doesn't matter. But these are the sounds for each of these centers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you chant them, you are supposed to activate these centers yes. and raise your awareness from gross to subtle until you reach the subtlest, mm -hmm. is what you do. So, it is a good practice. I think uh, it will work. Okay. You keep doing it, but you need constant practice. Mm. Do not think it is a shortcut. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> My second question, I am sorry. Is, I That's mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is connected to today actually, um, Gayatri Mantra. Um, today is Gayatri Jabam. Um, so, um, I mean, there are what talks is that. Today is Gayatri Jabam? I mean, yesterday was uh, Upakarma. But Gayatri every day is, you have to chant uh, Gayatri. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it is main, important mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. So, um, there are talks that women are not supposed to do that, mm -hmm. especially for a day like today. I would like to chant 1008 1, times of Gayatri Mantra. Please go home and chant. Okay. <laughs> I already did this one. Ah. Thank you. I think this is all. Uh, I think at one time this rule was not there. Then it came on later because men became more, society became more male oriented. If you go back to the original Valmiki Ramayana, not Ramcharita Manasa, which is only 700 years old, go to the Valmiki Ramayana, which is the first poem, epic poem written by. Valmiki. There is one place where Lakshmana wants to say something to Sita. Please read it. And Rama says, Brother, how can you go and talk to her now in the evening? She is doing her Sandhya Vandana. After that, I will call you. Now, how does Sita do Sandhya Vandana without chanting Gayatri? You tell me. So, I always tell people to chant the Gayatri. One day I was actually scolded and asked to go out of a conference by a Shankaracharya because I told some people to chant the Gayatri, women to chant the Gayatri. But it does not matter. I do not care. But I think, uh, you know what, I am of the opinion that we have had enough of men avatars. The next one has to be a woman. Because after all these avatars, men came and went, nothing has happened. We <laughs> are still in the same place. I mean, something has happened. But So, maybe we should experiment with a human avatar. I am not talking about the several Mathajis around. I am only talking about real. <laughs> hmm? We have 10 minutes more, 10 minutes more. If you recommend you just follow one hat or can you follow a blend? I can hear. Uh, can you follow a blend, you know, like do some Hatha Yoga, do uh, you know, some Karma mm, Yoga and then some? Some Yoga. Uh. <laughs> um, uh, not in Malayalam, in Sanskrit. Uh, I think uh, it is a good idea to do that, but it should not become like a khichidi. You know what I mean? So, one has to go at it little carefully. While it is good to do asans, no problem, good to do pranayam, 
if you can have a judicious mixture of all these it will be nice but then you must remember that as like all human beings there must be some special trait in you because of which you might concentrate more on that kind of yoga so this you have to find out for yourself if you're a person who's emotional then you cannot exclude bhakti from your system even if you try to come back in no way you can do it um if you are the kind who likes to like an experimental scientist then the practice of patanjali's yoga is very good there is no harm in mixing up but better do it under the guidance of somebody who has explored all parts then you will have some idea of what to start where to go how to carry on per se there is no problem with that <laughs> See, first let us assume, speculatively, let us assume that there are other regions of the brain to be explored. First, theoretically, let's say hypothesis. Okay, having done that, yoga has. When I say yoga, please don't mistake it for hatha yoga, the science of yoga, which every chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is called a yoga. 18 chapters starting with arjuna vishada yoga karma yoga sankhya yoga there so there are different approaches and when i use the word yoga i mean the, the method or practice by which one moves forward that's what i meant so yoga has prescribed different ways of trying to tap the other centers they start with actually trying to control the autonomous nervous system through the centers which are plexuses if you look you will see that where chakras are marked there are also plexuses so you have to look into this and figure out how to do if you want a simple practice start by just sitting down and watching your breath as the mind recedes into the inner then it will find its ways of working out this is a practical thing you can do needs no initiation this is initiation initiate means to begin something right initiate a process initiate an action so initiation means what putting somebody on the track it's not much involved with dark rooms and whispering into the ears in fact if you see something very mysterious shun it because truth is like the sun it it falls on every human being not only human being others also animals insects I practice uh, Kriya. Yeah. And then I took uh, Sri Vidya. Okay. Both are, you know, on the chakras. Yeah. I have confusion whether to, I mean, hit one and do other. You know, because mm-hmm. these are different. Uh, right, right, right. And uh, both are different. Okay. Even if I do it in different times, okay. like morning one, or evening one. Okay. Whether it harms anything. You chakras, can sit. Huh? huh? See now, if you have to take up the subject of Sri Vidya, we have to have another full satsang. Please sit down, sir. Um, so I don't know whether I can go into this, but practically, I see no contradiction in doing both together. However, when you say you are doing Sri Vidya, is it external puja or internal? Internal. So, are you doing the chanting of the bala, or are you doing the panchadashakshari and shodashakshari? What are you doing? Uh, mantra from the each petals and so on, like two. Uh, Now that gets a little complicated. Uh, I am bound by some rules. Uh, if you are chanting the sixteen-letter mantra, which uh, Yeah, are you doing that? Yeah. Only thing is, you should learn. Audio. It's also okay. Nothing like your own chanting, but um, there's no harm. You you don't try to do one in the evening and one in the mix it together. 
you do your kriya pranayam and after that sit for some time and do your shri vidya mantras fixing it on different center the thing is many people really don't know which center which shabda should go and how long it should be chanted if this is fixed then it will be very easy see each sound in the you know that the shri vidya doesn't have any shlokas basically although there are some preliminaries it is only sounds bijaksharas the thing is each bijaksharas depending on what kind of thing you are doing each sound has an effect so how, what matra how long you should chant for instance uh, anyway i, I can't so <clears throat> not because it is secret but it, um it's okay so if you have the mantra then you can chant it on in your centers but after doing your kriya don't mix the two after doing the kriya sit down and do your chant it's longer time and longer longer time longer do it time. What? there are no shortcuts sir <laughs> yeah one evening one is one evening okay you can do that but i would prefer that when you do the mantra chanting in the internal centers just after kriya it will be more effective that's why i'm saying yeah kriya we have prana prana sokha prana other one we don't have any prana yet but when i am doing the sri vidya it also happens me like a prana observation hmm that's okay initiation process for Uh, I'm. We'll see. <laughs> um, you know, I, you don't need to go into that and all that. If you have some devotion and do your yoga practice and so on, when it's Sri Vidya, simply means Devi, which means the Kundalini, the energy which is in us, represented as Parashakti, which is this is what Sri Vidya is all about. And it's called Sri because it is Devi, Sri Mati. and uh, vidya the knowledge okay so basically it's more to do with sound bijaksharas and how the bijaksharas are arranged and so on uh, you can't read from a book and do oh, it won't work that well but if somebody who has practiced it gives you it will be good unfortunately i'm a little worried because nowadays so all, all these things are sold on internet marketed so i'm a little concerned uh, anyway we'll see if you are very serious you will get it somehow this is the last question <laughs> sorry it's almost 8 o'clock when uh, one person when a person is already doing the kriya given by a guru is it recommended to just stick to that process and is it harmful to follow other gurus it, or methods um it depends on various factors if you are happy with what you are practicing and if you think you are spiritually progressing there is no need to go to somebody else you can go you can grasp as much knowledge as you can and help you in your path that there is no harm in that you don't have to accept that person as your guru or anything of that kind there is no harm knowledge you should seek wherever you can get there is no harm but the problem is when you go to most guru they say now you will follow only this you will not turn your head anywhere then there is a problem that is the problem uh, i have no problem because i am not in the business of collecting disciples i don't have a rooster in which i say ah how many people there is nothing like that whoever is freely comes i do whatever i can and leave it there and if they say i want to go to somewhere else go if there is no harm because i am you see one it's okay to teach spiritual matters but it should not become like a missionary you know so mm, since we said this i want to tell you a joke before you finish about missionaries yes some there was a gentleman who came from kenya he went back huh? oh, yes. he went away this is about kenya there was this um, 
Jammu Kenyatta was the first president of Free Kenya. So when the uh, foreign flag was lowered and the Indian, uh, the Kenyan flag went up, so he became the first president. He was in the freedom struggle for Kenya. So he gave a speech. It's a very interesting speech. One part of the speech is most interesting. He said, since we talked about missionary, you know, I'm telling you. He said, when the missionaries first came to this country, I mean, I don't want to imitate his, you know, his English was a little peculiar. He said, when the missionaries first came to this country, we had land and they had the Bible. Then they taught us how to pray with closed eyes. When we opened our eyes, they had the land and we had the Bible. <laughs> so watch out. <laughs> hmm? So it can apply not only to Christian missionaries. <laughs> hmm. Thank you. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti.